good to be back this year. You know, after the video project that um, I was a participant in last year, I think everyone, by the way, should give uh, Mrs. Connolly a round of applause. <laughs> and another round of applause for this year's uh, AV Health Committee. It was really Mrs. Connolly. It's, uh, it's her fault uh, that I'm that I am known to your school at all. Um, and I'm grateful to her, and I'm grateful to all of you for showing up today um, to have a pretty frank conversation with me about success. Um, I had a really hard time in high school. Some of you may remember some of the story from the video that um, we did last year. Life was really tough for me, and it may be tough for some of you too. And uh, what I want to do as we go through our talk today is just invite you all to be with your thoughts and your questions and your feelings about what is happening in your life. And you don't have to have answers to your questions. You don't have to have a solution for anything right now, but just to be present with your own full self as we go through a little bit of a journey. The problems that happened with my life early on that eventually led me to an incredible set of turnarounds and transformations and triumphs began really when I was a young boy. I was seven years old and raped by my female babysitter in my home. And she threw me out of my own house in my underwear with neighborhood kids playing in the yards on both sides of my house. The shame that a person could feel in such a situation could practically be a, a life ender. And I felt like I didn't really have any place to go. As I was growing up, I didn't feel safe in my house because that's where the attacks occurred. I didn't feel safe in my neighborhood because what the kids saw made me look very weak. They had no idea how strong I really was. And I didn't either. But they would torment me and hurt me and malign me and make nothing of me. By the time I was in high school, I really had no friends. I didn't feel safe at school because the bullying was so awful. And I had already been carrying with me the history of my very young life. And it was really heavy. Can you feel that? That is something that some of us in this room, I think, are going through. Just that feeling of heaviness, that, that I'm sinking like a rock. When I was a sophomore in high school, I had one last attack by a bully. And it started out on the school bus. He was bashing me with his books. And off the school bus, he chased me to my house and tried to beat the hell out of me. And I kicked and screamed and punched and did what I had to do to ultimately defend myself. 
I don't advocate violence, but I certainly advocate defending yourself in the moment. And I finally had the moment to do it. It was for my survival. A few months later, my father died. He had a heart attack. And I lost one of my guiding lights in my life. All in a sophomore year. So I was dealing with incredible loss and lacking in self-esteem. And a few months after that, something wild happened. I found a book called The Official Preppy Handbook. This was in 1985. And that book gave me what I called a system for living. Most of all, it included a system for dressing and style, preppy style. And I went out and bought all kinds of preppy looking clothes and wore things with pony or crocodile on them and flipped up my polo collars and walked a certain way and talked a certain way. I even invented a nickname for myself that was preppy, Skippy because I existed on peanut butter. It's kind of a cute way of, of making a little bit of light of myself, which was in its own way pretty remarkable because I didn't feel very light about myself at all. That's kind of where things began. And in terms of what I do today professionally as a stylist, showing up with some Gucci fabulousness for you today. Um, my evolution of life. Um, I actually began that journey into style as a 15 year old. It was a big lesson for all of us to learn from that today, which is when you crack open a book at school, there's a lot to study, there's a lot to learn. But there's stuff to learn in general just by being, just things that come out of what seems to be nowhere. The official preppy handbook was not a serious book. It was a farce, but I read it like it was the most important book I had ever laid my eyes on, ever. Like, it could be like the Quran or the Torah or, you know, any, significant spiritual, uh, like you need this to live, kind of a book. That was the official preppy handbook for me. And it was fascinating because in my discovery of style, I had a hypothesis that I hung onto and created my whole life because of this thought. I may never be tall. I may never be attractive. I may never be hot, sexy. <laughs> but I could have style. And if I could have style, I could have something about who I am from inside. I know sexy God. <laughs> um, I could find something about myself and let other people know what was really true about me. Because in school, every hour of the day, in between classes, past period, somebody would have the nerve to come up to me and tell me to my face how ugly I was. It wasn't just one person. It became a thing to do. And I was the object of that negativity and I didn't do anything to call for it. Sometimes in life things happen to you that you can't explain. It's what we do with it that makes us incredible, even to ourselves. And so after high school I went on to college where I then discovered 
was diagnosed that I have dyslexia. All my teachers couldn't figure it out because my grades tanked, my tests sucked. But everybody knew that I was really intelligent. And for me, that was what dyslexia laid out. And I thought, well, I gotta get out of this. I also thought about wanting to get involved in politics and government. I was very interested in serving the public. But here it was the late 1980s, and I thought, mm -mm. I've already been through so much in my early life trying to find myself and be myself. I can't be the gay politician. I can't be known as that. So I ditched the idea, and I ditched college. And I did it because I wanted to do something that came a little more naturally to me. I wanted, I wanted an easier life because that, up to that point, life was so difficult. College for me was really not the path. But I will tell you that I am a lifelong learner. And I instruct high-powered executives. I teach style seminars at law firms, and that kind of thing. And I am known as an expert for something that I could not have gone to school for, at least not at that time. And it all began because something came to me when I was 15 and attending a high school very much like yours that is nationally recognized and with a spirit of greatness and that you must achieve. I took that spirit of the need to achieve, but I took it into my own realm. What could I do that would be good for me? I couldn't work at pleasing other people to make them happy. I needed to make myself happy. And I owed it to myself because I had already suffered incredible unhappiness. So I started working in a retail environment that totally changed my life in another way. Further along into my life, I had an experience where I went to Hawaii. Sometimes things that happen when you're young they, come, they stay with you and they come back again later. I had unfinished business around well, losing my father when I was a boy, 15 and a half. And I went to Hawaii on purpose because I wanted to go someplace where I could feel myself the day that I outlived him by one day. So my father lived to be 43 years old and 55 days. And I was in Hawaii on the 56th day of my 43rd year around the sun. And I went to a place called Kaina Point. And I didn't know why in the world I was there, except it was a hike and it was gorgeous. But I was not prepared for the heat. I didn't have water. Weird thing being there. And I got all the way out to the end and I saw this placard. And it was about cutting a point. The Hawaiians believe that this place is a very important part of the journey of the soul. That when a person passes, their soul leaves the earth at Kaina Point. And when I I fell to my knees when this, when I read this because I was feeling something about being there. I just, I couldn't make sense of it. And I didn't know anything about this place. I let my dad go. So there are these things that can happen in your life where we're looking to unburden ourselves from the challenges and we have to keep going in our lives. 
Another story I want to share with you is about my favorite singer, songwriter, rock star, goddess, poet, heroine, Stevie Nicks from Fleetwood Mac. It was an incredible thing that I learned about her as a young boy, and she wrote this song called Landslide in 1974, and she wrote it in Aspen, Colorado. And she wrote it in 10 minutes, and she um, wrote it because she was at a crossroads in her life. And several years ago, I was at a crossroads in my life, and I went to Aspen because, for the first time, because I was inspired and moved by that song, that I needed to go and take a little time out from making everybody else look fabulous to be, you know, kind of regroup into my own inner fabulousness, whatever that is. And I went um, and had a wonderful experience and I kept going back to Aspen. Now, throughout all this time, over the intervening years since the first trip, I had done a video for the It Gets Better project um, that maybe some of you might know about from when you were very young. Um, I had an opportunity to tell people about coming out and about being LGBT and that it's okay who you are and that the journey of your life is worth living. And I got to speak about that on the video. And that kind of thing went viral with my high school classmates, little did I know. And I started having this incredible outreach with people that I knew at maybe the wrong time of my life and their lives, but it had become the right time to know each other. Eventually, one of those friends that I became close with on Facebook, Dave, reached out to me and said, hey Joseph, I know that you love going to Aspen. My girlfriend and my two daughters are going to Aspen in February. Would you like to come? When we finally had a phone conversation to talk about it, we both cried. I told him that he offered me a kind of healing in my life that I never could have anticipated about my childhood. And he wasn't responsible for anything that happened to me as a boy. He just wasn't my friend. But he wasn't my foe. He wasn't a bully. But he had heard about things that I had been sharing on Facebook that he imparted upon his teenage girls and essentially it changed, according to him, all their lives. And that feedback changed my life and gave me enc more encouragement to keep talking, to keep sharing the story. Because a lot of us don't have the confidence or the courage to tell our stories. But I want to make it safe and I want to destigmatize the idea that we can't tell these stories. In fact, we must tell them, especially in this day and age. We must reach out and we must create community with each other. We must find a few people who we relate with well. It can be a teacher, it could be a parent, it could be the parent of a friend. It could be your, each other, your peer group. We have to find a way of being able to create community instead of division within the community that we have. That's what happened where I grew up. Very upscale, very diverse in its own kind of way, as I recall it. Not diverse in all of other ways. And People are just so afraid of each other. People were so afraid of me. None of
one of them are up on the stage talking about the turnaround of their life. And when we can all be winners in our lives and find um, power in creating happiness and success for ourselves. So that was all thanks to following a path in my life around music that made me feel safe, that gave me a grounding. Um, I got a chance to create these bonds with people. So some important lessons through all this to share with you briefly. There's an ebb and a flow in life. Right? When you feel like things are swooping down and you feel really low about the way things are going, you're having a really tough day. You have to know that that's actually part of the flow. There's good and bad. There's happy and sad. There's two sides to everything. But when you're moving through your life, you're always moving ahead. And you have to keep going. You can't decide for some reason that you want to get off that ride. If I had done that, I wouldn't have the life that I have, oh, I wouldn't have any life, but I have the most incredible life that I couldn't have ever scripted. When we think about success, in the long view, I'm sure we all think about the degrees we want to earn, the jobs we want to have, the money we want to make, the places where we want to live. It's important because finding success is crucial to your own self-sustenance. You have to be able to take care of yourself. But what I have really learned, and that humbles me when I share my stories with clients who are of a totally different socioeconomic level than me, is that because they're super rich, most of them, I have to say, um, they look at me and think, wow, you have such a great life, it's so full. And I love having the ability to inspire people who are my clients that they too can have a better life. But it isn't really just about what you do with your success scholastically or financially. You have to have emotional success. That's what I call filling up your emotional bank account. Finding ways of creating that community. Finding ways of being good with being on your own. And, and finding a path into something that really means something to you. And at some point, you know, your life is your own to live. You can't, can't please everybody else. Being a pleaser is sometimes a recipe for trouble because we can get away from realizing how much we have to please ourselves, that we have to take care of ourselves. So in closing, <clears throat> the three lines of a song that I used to write down every day of my life as a teenager that saved my life were this. Take on the situation, not the torment. To me symbolized that life can be so difficult, but if you can, if I could do this differently now, if somebody were to bully me and attack me, I would handle it differently than I used to. I would get past the moment. The torment isn't what the bully did to me back then. The torment is what I did to myself. The torment is what I allowed myself to take on, the beliefs that other people had about me. And I needed to believe in me. So that's a turnaround. You don't have to believe in what other people say about you. You have to be firm in knowing who you are. Take on the situation, not the torment. Um, 
another line from that is, your fortune is your life's love. And I'll actually end with this one because I think it's the most profound. When I would write down these lyrics as a boy, um, I always wondered, what the world did she mean about that? Because I didn't feel like I had figured out what my life's love was. As it turned out, it was style, hello. And it was also very much about connecting with people because I had no friends growing up and I hungered for connection. And style, both personally and professionally, was about me having a proper outreach with the public, with people. And so that's how I have fortune today. But don't measure the fortune because of my Gucci jacket. Don't measure it because I've actually turned out okay. I've I'm opening my soul to you today so that you can see that I lead a rich, emotionally fulfilling life. And I think that it's really important and, and, and a very strong message to deliver to you all today in honor of this week, that that is our goal. That could be our number one goal, even if we don't think about it all the time. It just needs to be there humming in the background of our lives that I want to be a good person. I want to do something good today. I want to be productive. I want to connect with people. I want to help somebody who's having trouble. I want to be there for somebody. I want to make friends with somebody who scares me a little bit. I just want to know people who are different than me. You know, if you guys all do that at your school, your lives are going to be nothing but fantastic. Thanks. Do we have time for any uh, questions or is it time to go Questions? Oh yes, we have time for questions. Who, have, who may have a question? This is not the time to be shy. You have one. If you have a question, can you just uh, stand? So I can see. Hi. Yes. Awesome, how are you? What's your question? Oh, I'm awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Back this way. Did somebody have a question back that way?
want everyone to feel like they can aspire to being their best self. So it's really not about the trappings. When I tell you it's Gucci, I'm actually like making fun of it in a way myself, I'm trying to be more playful with my life because in a million years, when I was a kid, young, lost and confused, and just trying to get by every day, I didn't think that I'd have anything. I couldn't see the next day. So, I'm wearing Gucci. <laughs> and I am proud.
to repeat myself to find something that brings you a kind of joy. For me, there was joy in a lot of different aspects. Having everybody to not tell me that I was ugly anymore was very joyous. Feeling better about myself was incredibly joyous. The gift of self-discovery that leads me to being right here in front of all of you today, incredibly joyous. Lots and lots of things came because I started with just one little idea. The one little idea is sometimes the biggest thing you will ever do because it's the little thing that keeps going and stays in your heart and in your mind. So if you're extroverted and you really like being around people and you, and, and you need that and you're not getting that, you need to make sure you're doing things that get you that. If you're introverted and you really like doing more things on your own or with small groups um, and really having like seriously intimate friendships where you feel really close and you can trust each other and you can talk to each other about anything, you need to get what you need. You need to ask yourself permission to go out there and, and get those things. If you can do that, you can really overcome the most serious hardships in your life. And you don't have to feel like you're alone, and you don't have to suffer. I only wish that somebody had stood before me when I was in high school to advise me of this. I don't know where I would be today. I would be off on another realm. But the journey as it was for me has allowed me to learn those kinds of things and to take them on the journey that I have where I made the most of it. So it really does come down to just coming to the question and answer. You don't have to know it right now, like I said at the beginning of our talk. You just have to have a vision for being open to discovering what could bring you joy. Even I, the bully boy, thrown out of his house in his underwear and all that stuff, in a vast black sky full of nothing, looking out, I still found that little pin dot of light to go towards and to find that joy. Your whole life can be built on that one little thing. And that would be my advice for everybody. Can we give him one round of applause, please? Thank you so much for coming.